those positions, that, 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 those positions. Play, play in that position, yeah. Oh, no, the goalkeeper, it's not the goalie. Chelsea years before falling off the train to start him and ending up in the lower leagues. 
It goes on like that. Kasper Schmeichel was told he had no future at Man City, dropped all the way down to the fourth tier of Notts County before he could get a game. Uh, Captain Wes Moment didn't play in England's top flight till he was 30. Jamie Hardy is the one I was telling you, was playing semi professionally until four years ago. But, and um, while he was playing as an amateur footballer, he had to wear an ankle monitor because he was on probation for being guilty of some assault outside. And it goes on and on. So, I, I mean, you're getting the point over here. A year before Kante was playing in front of a few thousand in the French division. And it ends with it saying, people may tell you that you're worthless, not believe, and send you away. Never get discouraged. Continue in life, work hard, and one day you'll get to make those who reject you. Reject you they, will, they will clap to you. And this is thanks for the lesson. Now, what struck me was, okay, that's all well and good. It's true and it's inspiring, but hang on a second. We just did that two years ago in India. Okay? So that's what I made in as a reply to a journalist, uh, somebody, and I sent it to I'm not going to send it to the journalist. I don't need to toot my own horn. I'll save it for a better occasion where it can be more useful. And this is the first time I'm actually showing it to people. And it is like Curtis and Simon and John Johnson were released from Premier League clubs uh, academies, and they dropped down to the fourth tier. And they came here, they won the league in the first year. Johnny Manyonga, Sean Rooney arrived as free agents because they had been discarded by other IV teams. Sunil Chetri had cut short his two-year contract with Sporting Portugal because he only played about 43 minutes of that in the entire time. Okay. And um, ended up being top four scorer for us. Pablo Kumar was released by Salgawaka. The other two goalkeepers were released by their club. They'd only played academy football. So the runner-up for the young player of the year, Chiam Angil, had been released by the Indian Under-23 team. And so had Shankar. And both players have gone on to represent Indian Under-23. Played the ISL and made shitloads of money. Like I think one of them just signed a contract of 35 lakhs. It's far more than he's worth. But, you know, credit to him. He's 24 years old and earning that kind of money. Fair play to him. Okay, and uh, so these guys were in Salgawaka. So you get my point. And we went on to win the league in this thing. And why that happened is, is what we're kind of here for today. And this is where I think there's a massive market in India because whenever I get um, guys coming up and saying, uh, I want to work in football, I want to do some analysis, and uh, they'll send you a pitch. And so, hey, yeah, sure, send me, send me something you've done, so let's have a look. They'll send you something like a Manchester Derby analysis. Manchester United versus Man City, Guardiola did this next season, and uh, there's a guy coming on Marine. So we all this analysis of all that, and I'm like, yeah, that's great, looks pretty, uh, nice pictures, all the names, but it's of absolutely no relevance to me, because I can't use it. So when it comes to football knowledge, if you guys want to get out of here and then use something in an Indian situation, it has to be what I call usable knowledge. And um, so, and that's the kind of thing where we need to start getting an understanding of Indian football, or Indian football scenarios, and Indian the business of Indian football, something we were just talking about just now as well. So then it becomes relevant. Because this is something now every owner in the world is going to want to copy. Because the clubs were spending 250 million in their transfer policy, or ID clubs were spending 20, 30 crores, ISL teams were spending 40 to 60 crores, they're going to suddenly think, hang on a second, if you can do that without spending that much, that's what we want to do. Everyone's going to want to do that. And that's where I think a lot of younger people can come in with the mindset of doing it the right way. Because the people who run these clubs have been there, um, you can tell us they're an expert on the club, the clubs, those guys have been there since way before all of us were born, and they'll continue to be there, even after you guys have kids as well. And again, they won't change their mindset. So you, you need people with fresh ideas and fresh thinking that can come and show people from both a business point of view and from a sporting point of view how you can actually make a massive difference by just simple, simple and common sense analysis. So this is what we... I pitched to Bangor FC, the Jindal people, when they started the club, and this is how you should structure your club. This is pretty much how on AFF uh, coaching courses as well. They will ask me that this is how a club structure should be should be in India. And I, for me, and I was looking over this because this is something I made three years ago. And I thought, if you look at how football's evolved both in India and across the world, I think one of the biggest things that's missing is that a sporting director. I think in the news recently, I think Man United were even talking about it, getting a sporting director. And the reason is because they spent 200 million over the last couple of years. Have any Man United fans there? One over there obviously with a shirt over there. How much did they spend in the last year? About 400 over the last two years, right? So you're spending 400 million with no kind of policy about it. To me, that doesn't make any sense. So if you have, and this is what's happening massively in Europe, they have a sporting director who controls a lot of the spending policies and how things happen. Because at the end of the day, managers come, managers go. Okay, it's a bit like girlfriends. Okay? Uh, or boyfriends. And, um, but the clubs will always remain. So it's, that's 
the way they have to start looking at it as a business that this guy's going to go, he's going to bring in a different player, but we have to have a policy of what we're going to do and how we're going to go about doing it. And I think this is where everybody in this room has a potential if you're into sport, you're into football, because there's so many, there's so many verticals over there to use the management on which they love using verticals. But I think this is where a sporting director can have a massive influence. So whether you're directly influencing the first team about what kind of players you're signing, is there money in this? So nowadays it could be whether you're telling an ID team, go after this player, and they're like, why should I sign Eugene Linger whose team got relegated? And I was like, we, we can get him for 20 bucks. And they're like, the following year, BFC made, he actually cost them, they made money on it, he cost them nothing. They went to the ISL and got an auction for over a pro. Okay. So in the three years we've had him, he's actually basically been there for free. Okay. So that, that is tremendous business sense. And that is what I see a sporting director in India doing for a professional club. Is where you can bring that kind of business action into them. And then any doesn't matter how rich these businessmen are, how many crores of black money they have and how much they don't mind losing or spending. As soon as you can start bringing savings to them, they will appreciate it. Second place which I see massive uh, potential, and we'll touch upon this later, is the scouting. Because we don't use technology. This is the most bizarre thing. Uh, Premier League uses Prozone, and they've used Prozone for years. It's one of the best uh, systems for analysis. I think. Where's Prozone do all their work? I think it's Chennai, right? Yeah. It was Chennai, right? Yeah. It was Chennai, right? Yeah. So all the rival right Premier League doing all this, I was like, our brilliant stats, blah, 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 all the work's being done over here. Yet, in India, we don't do anything when it comes to the I League or I mean, the ISL nowadays, it's a little bit. But we, this is some, in an area where there's massive potential, especially nowadays with people developing apps and everything like that. There's so much you could do and devise stuff that could be both, could be something that you could sell onto a club or have like what these guys are doing, have a platform where clubs can buy them or use their resources because it's a massively neglected area. And why I, I'm targeting new development because I just got back from um, the Northeast and the reason I went there is Modi just went there. <laughs> it's not that I didn't go to see him after he left I went. But if you've probably been reading in the papers, you see what he's planning on doing that. He's chucking a load of money into sport. So I'm not going to get the political reasons of why he's doing it or what they're doing, because that's not my concern. And frankly I don't care. As long as they're going to chuck a couple of thousand crores into the northeast to develop sport, brilliant, it's good for me. Okay? So and it's good for everybody. So they're trying to develop that area in sport and what's happening now is every Tom Dick and Harry in India is off to the northeast to pitch to the Chief Minister of Meghalaya or Assam and say we can do this, we can do that. Because people believe that's the hotbed of Indian football, but how do we nurture that talent and develop it and bring it to the next stage, which is professional football and the greatest thing would be any of them can go on and play a role. So but there isn't the expertise and people to tell them how to do it. Everyone will go and tell them this time and on a traditional, let's set up the residential academy. Because if you set up a residential academy, let's say in Assam, then we'll get the best 20 players from Megalia, Mizoram, Manipur, Nagaland, and put them in there, and let's say Arunachal as well, and we find so 100 good players, we put them in there. Guess who makes the most money? Probably the guy who owns the land where they're going to build the land, probably. Yeah. Who's going to make the next biggest bit of money? Contractor who builds the campus. Right? And then the nice, oh, we need these fields, we need swimming pool, we need this, we need turf field, we need grass field. He'll make a lot of money and walk away. And the next guy who's going to make a fat load of money is the caterer. You need to feed these kids breakfast, lunch, and dinner, uh, 300 rupees at least, probably per day, or more than that, 500 rupees a day. So, irrespective of whether any of these footballers in the next 10 years goes on to become a professional footballer, he's going to make 500 and 100, okay? every single day of these players or whoever's the guy funding this project. And because it's government money, no one's accountable, so it doesn't matter. And these guys will walk away with the end of it and nothing happens. So there's a tremendous potential there for, sorry, for people to do it the proper way and actually make sure, and this is where you can actually show them with business models and stuff, that having a residential academy is probably not the best way to do it. You got satellite academies in different places and they didn't do it, just like everybody else does. And Cricket expert will tell you, the Virat Kohli's and Rohit Sharma's and all didn't get thrown in when they were 12 into some residential academy which was founded by some government and then they stayed there until they were 18 and then wow, at 18 they came out and were the best cricketers in the world. They played in their own places and just like it does everywhere else in the world. And lastly, I mean, like that marketing side and the business development side is 
clubs again, we, if you look at the way, if you, just out of curiosity, and I think, especially because of what you guys are doing, NBA and stuff like that, if you look at how businesses are run, football clubs are run, they're probably the worst businesses in the world. So there's always a joke about it. But what's the easiest way to make 100 million in football? You start with 1,000 million and buy a football club. <laughs> and end up with 100 million. In fact, every single I League club loses money. Not a single one of them makes money. Every single ISO club loses money. The difference is I League clubs lose between anywhere between 5 to 15 crores a year. ISO clubs lose between 20 to 40 crores a year. Everyone's losing money. Okay? Because, and that's the reality in most places across the world. Even your Premier League clubs, a lot of them are losing money. The difference is they have an Arab sheikh who can come in and afford to waste a certain amount of money, or it's a Russian oligarch or a Thai businessman with unaccounted money. Okay. But losses are happening. But you can stem the, the losses by just having a little bit of common sense and showing them where you can put business practices in. in them. Because if you look at, like, they take Mr. Dempo, so you Dempo, for example, of Dempo football. How he runs his other businesses, nice football clubs, are very sensible, and you know they will trim places where they've got loss-making arms, and they will trim it. When it comes to football, it's like, ah, yeah, I don't know, I'm going to lose 15 goals a year anyway. So if that player's getting one and a half max and he's sitting on the bench, it's okay. Or if we've got a physio, we'll, we'll, which is the common thing they do, we'll get physios who aren't competent and then we'll get expensive assets like players sitting on the bench because the physio is good enough. So again, these are the areas where I think there's a massive potential for youngsters in India to get involved in football clubs because there is a serious lack of this. We've got coaches who are experts, they know a lot about football and they can talk about football, but when it comes to making an Excel sheet, presenting it to their boss, they can't. When it comes to thinking like where we'll be in a few years if we keep spending like this, they can't. They can't do projections, they can't do things like if we start spending more on physio or nutrition or sports science, what will the benefits be and all that. So the business side of it is something that's massively, massively in debt, especially in the I League and especially in the ISL. So like I said, the other one was scouting. So we'll get into scouting. Now these are the main things we look at in terms of football. So where we look at the opposition, we look at individual players, and we look at your own team's performance. So, instead of me just talking, so let's get a little bit of you guys, your opinion on it. So let's just look at the opposition analysis. So what do you think we would look at when we're looking at opposition analysis? Strategy of opposition. So, how am I going to get, let's say we're playing, uh, so long, like, oh, we're, we're realistic. Let's make it realistic. Bangalore FC is in the quarterfinals of the AFC Cup. They've got Champions Rovers of uh, Singapore. Singapore on the 14th of September. Right? So, what do I do now to analyze Champions Rovers at the moment? Okay, so how am I going to do that? Look at the past few games, what all the Okay, past few games. So, how many games? Six, seven, games, six, seven, eight, eight. Yeah, that's typically what we'll do. We we'll watch between six to ten games. So that's watching those 90-minute games. We clip it down. So that's where the analysis comes in. You can't watch 90 minutes. It gets boring. You, know, you need to compress it to ball and pitch. When we do the ball and pitch down for about 30 minutes uh, each half, 25 to 30 minutes, and then you watch that, and then you get your formation trends. What else do you think? Company called Insta, which is a Russian-based um, company. 
So you'll see the, um, the, de the details. So this is what you'll get if you go on any website and uh, for a UK match and everything like that, which in India on gold.com you won't get this kind of stuff. But it goes on and on. It goes into little minute details about which flanks they attack on, so what you've got to expect against them, ball possession, breaks it up into little 15 minute segments, breaks it up into little individual segments amongst those time periods of attack, where they attack, what happens with set pieces, what happens when um, tackles, passes, etc. Um, it goes on and on and on. And then again, they break the pitch down into little zones because there are certain zones which are very important. And this is obviously the most crucial zone because most assists come from that area, known as zone 14. And you start, you start to see how much detail. So this is going on, minutes, percentage, every individual player breaks down, count with what they do. And again, it goes on about the opposition, more, our individual pitch maps, heat maps, where exactly they were on the pitch. So if this is our defender, or so we got Reno Andro over there, so we're quite happy he's getting forward and getting into attacks, and so is our left back, so pretty good. But you can see probably they're both joining in attacks evenly well, and then we can check with our heart rate monitor how much distance they've covered in our GPS as well. So also if a player you turn around and get into an argument about saying you're not working hard enough, and he says, yeah, I am. Then you look at his pitch map, and this is all blank for him. Say, look, your left back's getting forward, or not. Simple, there's no argument about it. So, and similarly, you can see the distance, the number of touches. Now, the criticism I had in Sunil after this game, and he said, Coach, what am I doing? Why am I not scoring? It's as simple as that. You touch the ball once inside the penalty box. If you don't touch the ball in the box, you're not going to score. How many times did Jamie Vardy touch the ball in the box yesterday? Zero. Zero touches inside the box. Sorry, not Jamie Harry Kane. Good question. So, <laughs> Harry Kane didn't touch the ball in the box, didn't score a goal. No surprise is that. So these are little things, it's little things, but as you see, it's not that little because it's 31 pages of this stuff. So now, keep going, because this is what we have to do as coaches and analysts. So not as fun as it looks on TV when they do all the fancy stuff because they, the guy, there's somebody like at the back end doing all the hard work so that people can do all the fancy touchscreen stuff and it looks good for us on TV. Okay. But, so six to ten games, now you've already seen the problem, we're talking about 180 to 300 pages of stuff that you've got to go through. So, how much time do you think you have to present to a player? Okay, we've got this match now against Champions Rovers. We've got to get all that information which we've collated about the style of play, where they attack from, what their weaknesses are, the left back's not very good, he's actually right footed, so he's cut inside, we're going to do that. So, how much time do you have to get that information into a player? One minute after One minute after Yeah. I mean, on average, we each person. Normally, we do a 12 minute presentation. And why 12 minutes? Because I already see some of you, like, it's been probably 12 minutes, some of you are just listening. So, you can see that the attention span, whatever it is, whether it's anybody giving a lecture or anything like that, it's difficult to concentrate longer than that. And footballers are notoriously worse because you're at least used to being in a classroom environment, sitting there having a table notes and listening to people. Where's football is now? The last time they went to school was probably a long, long time ago. Some of them, I mean, if they went, they were probably looking to get out. So they don't have an attention span, they can't concentrate. That's our job or your job then of me being able to take the 100, 300 pages and put it into a format that is of a bite size, that you go into them, and don't forget, you're then talking about trying to impart it in a way where you've got a guy from Manipur whose English isn't great, because Hindi is probably not great, a guy from Mizoram who speaks no Hindi, little English. Okay. And you've got a guy from Kerala, you've got a guy from Punjab. So you've got all, it's like having like almost like 70 to 7 to 10 different personalities in your team. And you've got to put it in a manner which is which they can all understand. Obviously you do a little bit on, quite a bit on the pitch as well. But what the last impression that's left of them is what the presentation that you make. make okay. So that's what, that's the, uh, the tough part of... Um, <coughs> The, uh, so, right. so, when it comes to the player analysis, which is where we're talking about scouting and I think uh, we want you to touch upon some scouting, what do you think we look for in players when we're analyzing players? Like if, if I'm going to go sign a player now for a club, what should I look for? It's a technical ability. Alright? What else? Okay. So, to bring
break it down super quick, like speeding me up on this one, we won't go through individually. So that's it. So all the technical aspects you'll come in with are you with these buttons. You can play with the left foot, whether you can play with his right foot, whether he's two foot, whether he's good at taking three kicks. Um, can you head the ball? All these little things. Tactical ability is an understanding of the game, what you see in game situations. So somebody when there's one minute to go, you're winning one, and he tries to score a, put a cross in and they keep against some counters. Okay? Or is it someone who's got the understanding to take the one play? Physically, you know, is the player going to grow anymore? And this is something that's crucial over here because you have a lot of age cheating in Indian sports. So you'll see a player, you know, he's 16, he's really good, three years' time, you get taller. So someone says he's short, now you get taller, he's got two more years. The reality is he's not 16, he's actually 20. Okay, so he's not going to grow. So these are little things where, as a scout, you need to know all these things and bring all these things into the table and bring this information to the coach or to the person behind them. In psychology, there's someone said about learning capacity. That's something that's massively underrated. So when you're looking at players, it's can they adapt? So can they come to your environment and actually improve and become better? Rather than just become stagnant because they don't have that ability to learn. <coughs> so for you guys, where I see like massive career options in India is, that these are the three biggest things at the moment. So whether it's ISL teams, I League teams, national teams, and the national academies and everything like that. They need people who can go out there and do it. This is the easy one, okay? The easy one is the um, ISL because all the information is on TV. You can go download it, who played, what all the stats are. This is less access and there's almost no access. So this is where I think if people can come up with either some form of technology or some form of networks where you can get information from people, whether it's a match that's happening in um, the Northeast, an under-19 match happening in Goa, and how can we collate that information where anybody can anywhere access it? We live in a mobile age, but we, we don't, there's no way we know who played in the match in Shillong yesterday between Langston and Shillong Lajang, unless I pick up the phone and call a coach or call somebody in Shillong and get that information. And that's only the only information. It's not open to everybody over there. And this is something that unless we get, and whereas when you go abroad, you can just go on and say, I need a left back who can do 100 meters in under 12 seconds. I want it to be six foot plus, okay? And have this many minimum years of experience. And you can go in and log in into an Excel format and find it. And we don't have that system. So for me, and I was talking to Naveen about it, that's something that I find with things called the Indian Football Coaches Alliance, where we want to work with people, whether it's analysts, whether it's different sports people, different fields of football, and try and get this system in place whereby we can actually have a network of people that can gather information, and you have your information, you have your analysis, you have your other things, so we can put people in the right places and actually help Indian football go forward. Okay, that's it. Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for a fantastic presentation and you gave a good perspective of what exactly can be expected in Indian football. Uh, uh, we have got like, time for a couple of questions. So anyone has got a question, so Pradeep will be, Jesse can take it right over here. And also you'll be there a bit for the networking break, you can also meet him out uh, for that. So, time for two questions. Anyone there on the Manchester United? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Can you just go to the previous slide? This one or the previous one? The previous one. Okay. okay so what is the uh, weightage you give to each one of these topics? Do you have a percentage pre-designed weightage or...? That's a good question. Now it depends. My answer to that would be it depends. That's not the easy coach's answer for everything. The reason, the reason I'll say it depends is it depends what age. If I'm looking at a player when we're scouting for, let's say we're looking at potential academy talent, and we think we're going and looking at under 12 players, under 10. Then I'm not so, so concerned about his technical ability and his tactical ability, because that's our job to develop it. Okay? Now, physically, if he's a goalkeeper we're looking at, the goalkeeping coach might say, right, go look at his parents. See if his dad's six foot tall. See if his mom's tall. If they're both short, then it could be something that we, it's not going to go and become a six foot plus goalkeeper. And physically, again, these are things that are going to develop. So you're not too concerned if they're too short or they're not muscly enough because that's something that we can develop. The psychological thing at that age is important. It's the way he is, his ability to learn or how he interacts with other players in the team and how his behavior is, is important. Now when we get to a different age group, if it's we're recruiting for a professional team, if I'm now looking for a player from an ISL team, um, again, it's, it's difficult to put a percentage weightage on it because he could be technically brilliant, the best striker there is in India that's unnoticed. Left foot, right foot. Got decent heading ability, strong, can hold the ball up. Tactically, he's okay, he understands it, he's coachable in that regard. 
I mean, understand his position as a number nine. He may not be flexible. He can't play anywhere else from a nine, so it's not got that much tactical flexibility. But the coach is fine with the ice. Of course, it doesn't matter about other foreigners in that position. Physically, he's a bit overweight. Okay, he's out of, position, out of shape at the moment. And this is the truth. I'm talking about a player that I'm scouting. And, uh, but we feel it's pre-season. We can get him down into shape and we'll get him into decent shape. Psychologically, the issue is, the reports were, he's got a bit of a drinking problem. And back in the day, that's why he dropped out of the top level of Indian football, because he likes a beer. Okay, now, where your knowledge of scouting comes into it is, he's now gone on, since that drinking issue happened, he's gone on to get married, he's got two kids now. And so his motivation now in life is different. So, if you don't know, know that level of details about why, what happened, and all that, it's very easy to just say, dismiss it. So, now, so it depends on your knowledge as a scout. So if your knowledge was only up to 2013 with him, then yeah, the drinking guy, yeah, he's, he's cracked, don't touch him. Okay. If you've met him recently, met people in Mizoram who've spoken to him and know a bit more about the history about it, then let's say, yeah, why not take a risk on that? So again, it depends on your ability as a coach. If you're a kind of coach who spends a lot of time doing technical sessions, you can improve the technical tactics of it. If you're a coach like in the ISL where they don't have time, they want ready-made players, you don't have time to focus on the first two. The physical, your fitness coach can take care of it, but if he's got problems with drinking and you're putting him in a five-star hotel with his own room, <laughs> okay? Well, lots, you know, I won't go into it, but what happens, but you know what happens. So, yeah, so does that help? The reason why I asked you this question is, typically you have a, a, a role model which has X, Y, Z parameters, and if you're looking to replicate that, in the, in the, in the, in the you know, fresh players you're trying to score from, is that the modus apparently or is it? My question was, hey, can, can you just take it offline, you know, the follow-up question for this thing? Sure. We've got one more there, yeah. uh, we'll just finish yeah. up with that. Okay, so Pradeep, how do you ensure this is uniform, not subjective? Because as coaches, like say the physical aspect and say Mizuna or Lottie is going to be a lot more than say in South India. Mm -hmm. So then how do you come up with a standardized method of deciding if you can compare these two individuals as such? Because everything is so subjective, depending on the person who's counting the people over there. Now you can put a number, say, completing 100 meters in 20 seconds. So something with respect to say, the tactical game sense or something with respect to say physicality is, is, is very subjective. Yeah, see, they, I agree. The physical side is easy to measure. We do tests, so you, it's standard 20 meters, how much speed, this, that, and the other. So that, that's, that's clear. So we know in our team, Udampa is the fastest player on the team over 20 meter distance, that's right, over a short but Over a longer distance, Curtis will probably be. Right, that's fine. But now, yeah, I agree. The tactical understanding of the game is where it is to a certain extent subjective because as a coach you've got the more games you watch you'll understand whether these players can do it the more people you speak to so if you speak to his former coaches and not just like he's come from an Indian under 19 academy like I'll give an example of Malsam Zola you speak to the two coaches who work with him in the Indian under 19 team you speak to the Chanmari coach in Mizoram and you speak to Lajong as well who released him and why they released him so then you get a bigger picture but my view on why he might be a good player another coach like Rupert actually might think I don't think he'll make it, man. So that's a constant debate you have amongst coaches. Our goalkeeping coach might have a different opinion on it. And we argue like, help coaches, but this guy is not good. I know he has a bad game, the next guy goes, and he has a good game. He says, ah, see, I told you so. But that's, you'll never get, football is very uh, subjective that way when it comes to um, picking a player. But you can't be standardized about it. Because you don't want your team of robots where everyone's similar. You need a variety. If you're making a substitution, you don't want the same player on the bench. He's coming off, so it will ties up with that. If you're bringing off a tunic, if you want something else coming on, that's a different prospect. Or there's like a Robin Singh as we had before. So you need something that falls apart. And um, you have to then tweak. If they're not tactically, but maybe they're better off the subs. 